Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. My name is Clint. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. What have you put around me, Noah, for God's sake? I'm really delighted to be here. As soon as I get my necklace sorted out, I'll... I don't know what the hell Ray said up here about the five finalists. And, uh, <clears throat> Noah called me and asked me to make the mark off the weekend because I was in the running with 27 other people, <clears throat> including the guy that runs the coffee bar at a 12-step house in Oxnard, California. <clears throat> But I'm glad to be here. I was here a couple, two and a half years ago at the north end of the island for a real quick uh, run. It was just one of those uh, in one day and out the next, and I didn't have a chance to spend any time in your lovely community, and I'm delighted, I'm really delighted to be here and uh, share this weekend with you. I'm very glad to be here, and I'm delighted to to see Chris get the uh, Honorary Alcoholic Award. That's, uh, I understand that was kind of a close call, too. Mike was telling me it came down between Chris, uh, who's a cashier at Coco's, and the night manager at the Wailana Coffee Shop. <laughs> <clears throat> and they're going to make him an honorary dope fiend next week. <clears throat> Things have changed a little bit since I was here two and a half years ago. Ray and Mary got married, I understand, about, what, 13 months ago, and that's, uh, that's terrific. Uh, 14 months ago, Ray, uh, Mary came into quite a sizable sum of money. <laughs> uncle died and left her a lot of money, but I don't, I know that it, uh, it made no difference at all to Ray. I, I, I'm sure that he would have married her no matter who left her that money. there are some people that are new in their experience in Alcoholics Anonymous here tonight. And I'm sure there are some people that are attending their first conference of this kind tonight, and I welcome you. You are welcome here. You are most welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I have uh, uh, sensed a great feeling here all weekend. I sensed it when I was here before, and I remember being touched by the fact that there is a feeling here about Alcoholics Anonymous that makes me feel wonderful, a feeling that makes me feel absolutely terrific, and it's a feeling that I, I, as I can get no closer to describing the feeling than to tell you that I sense here a deep respect for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of Al-Anon, and I congratulate you for that. And I welcome newcomers here because there are a lot of fun moments ahead for you if you stay with this marvelous group of people. And so I'm glad you're here, and I hope you stay, and I hope you... You'll be told, incidentally, that you're the most important person in the room in an AA meeting. That is not the case here tonight. <clears throat> I'm the most important person here tonight. <clears throat> Just the way it is. And I'll tell you something else. 
my sobriety, and I'm not kidding about this part, my sobriety is more important to me than the sobriety of anybody else in this room. And, and that's really the way it is. Uh, we are the guardian of our own sobriety, and I hope you can develop that attitude about your sobriety. You are the guardian of your sobriety, and if you're new here tonight, you will learn quickly, if you stay, that it's incumbent upon you to get actively involved and participate in your own recovery. That's the only way your recovery will take place. And I say that because I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and without really knowing it, I kind of looked around for somebody that might work this program for me. <laughs> and that's uh, kind of one of the ideas that I had to give up. But it's just the way it is. But I'm delighted to be here. I'm just absolutely delighted. I was delighted to attend the other meetings yesterday and today. I was touched by Blanche's extraordinary talk at the Al-Anon meeting yesterday, and I was touched by the fact that she made a comment that we hear from time to time. We all have a great loyalty to our home in our area, and uh, as she does to Texas, and as you do to uh, this beautiful place and as I do to my home and uh, we all have a certain affinity and a great feeling for the home group we have in Alcoholics Anonymous and I uh, call the uh, Saddleback Speakers Group of Dana Point, California my home group and I'm delighted to uh, have that as a home group. There's a, a, a wonderful feeling of Alcoholics Anonymous in that group and I'm bring you greetings from those people. I, we have um, a common bond, Alcoholics Anonymous members around the world, and, and it's certainly part of this weekend and what's happening here. And uh, I was astonished to discover how many different places uh, have sent people here. Boston, I noticed on somebody's name tag, and a lot of people from Canada and people from all over the United States and some people from Australia. And so it's a terrific collection of human beings. I'm looking forward to hearing Martha tomorrow, and I know it's going to be a terrific way to close this weekend. My beginnings in Alcoholics Anonymous were uh, <clears throat> in no... It did not feel like a beginning of anything to me. I had been brought here to you by a bail bondsman, which I guess it's one way to get here. I, um, he really had given up on me and in desperation, and he's never brought anybody here since that time, and nor had he ever brought anybody to AA before, but this bail bondsman that had bailed me out of jail many times in Southern California, took me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I call him every year on my birthday and thank him for that. It's kind of an interesting conversation. At the beginning, I say, Don, it's Clint. He says, who? <laughs> Clint Hodges. He said, oh, yeah, where are you, Clint? <laughs> He's never sure, you know. He's as surprised as I am that this thing works for me the way it does. <laughs> and it works remarkably well, and I hope before we're done tonight you will have some sense of the, of the uh, wonder that I have still for the uh, program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was outside earlier today, yesterday afternoon by the pool, and I heard somebody scurrying around for something they'd lost, and they turned to somebody else and said, do they have a lost and found department here at the hotel? And I wanted to say, yeah, it's in that room over there, in that ballroom. Lost and found, you know, that's what we are. Jesus, it's just an incredible thing. I heard somebody say one night at a meeting that once you've been lost, really lost, you never get over the wonder of being found again. And I am found, and I am so grateful because I'm just a drunk. 
and I haven't had a drink all day long. I haven't wanted a drink all day long, and I've uh, had a lot of days now like that. And it's uh, a, a thoroughly remarkable life that I have. And so I'm glad to be here and share it with you. When that bail bondsman brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous, he did it out of compassion and out of pity and out of a sense of despair. He and I had kind of become friends over the uh, time we'd known each other. It was uh, basically a business arrangement, but uh, <clears throat> he'd given me a job selling encyclopedias for him door to door, and I tried to do that for a while, and he was quite uh, uh, compassionate, really. Thank you. Thank you. Where was I? Start, start over again. My name is Clint. I'm an... I was, in those days, I was living in a garage in Glendale with three other guys. And uh, I was not at the top of my game in any sense of the word. Things were not good for me. I was in and out of the Glendale drunk tank and in and out of Lincoln Heights a time or two and out of county jail a couple of times. And it was just the way it was. Some days I woke up in jail and some days I woke up in the garage and it really didn't make a lot of difference after a while. You know, it's... Uh, in fact, waking up in the garage was... Um, any time I woke up, it was a time of terror. You know, we lived that way. That garage was just uh, uh, as bad as jail. Sometimes jail was... You know, you wake up in the garage and you need a drink real bad. Real bad. And when you wake up in jail, as soon as you know where you are, you don't need the drink quite as bad. You know, there's something about knowing you're not going to get a drink for a while, it uh, eases that terrible need. Uh, and waking up in jail lends a certain predictability to the day as well. Uh, <laughs> not going to get arrested. Uh, <laughs> And yet, sooner or later, when the felony tank empties, they take me and the rest of the guys in the drunk tank down to the, one of the courtrooms and stand in front of the guy. And uh, they want to know how you plead. And it just the choices are limited. It's uh, <laughs> guilty or not guilty. <clears throat> I was... Uh, we looked for different, uh, another option would be nice, you know. Some guy said guilty with an explanation, and that has a certain... I heard a gal in a meeting, one. I have been touched so many times by what I've heard in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and I haven't forgotten one night a woman said that uh, all she ever wanted was another option. When she went to the meat market, she... All she wanted was another animal to pick from, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, just... <clears throat> guilty or not guilty. Guilty with an explanation. And those stories were remarkable that those guys offered up, some of them. I never really believed that I was guilty of the charge that was being made. Drunk. for I wasn't really drunk. Not what you'd call drunk, drunk. <laughs> if I remembered the arrest, I didn't think I was drunk, you know. Bad checks? No. No, I didn't. 
Oh, I'm, I'm guilty. I've been guilty since I was four, but I, I'm not, not guilty of... Who knew that one might go through? You can't tell, you know. You just... Shit, it's... In, It could happen. What the hell? <laughs> Drunk driving? Nah. I was arrested one morning about 10 a.m. for drunk driving. And I, wa I, th I really thought I was going to pass the field sobriety test that morning, and Three weeks later, when I got, saw a copy of the police report, it said that they discontinued the field sobriety test because the suspect was injuring himself. from a long way back we, uh, we pick up some odd ideas uh, Blanche touched on them in, uh, yesterday uh, those funny ideas we have and the mixed messages that come along uh, I grew up in a home where my father was uh, a drunk and brought a lot of violence into our home and I was afraid of him and I was uh, I always felt so cowardly around him because I wanted to challenge him. I wanted to stick up for myself. I wanted to stop the fight between him and my mother, and I, I couldn't bring myself to do that, and I called myself a coward, and I felt so cowardly about that for so very long, and I hated him for the violence and for the... We saw uh, a couple of shows recently uh, about domestic violence, and God, they still have the capacity to turn my stomach and make me extremely uncomfortable. That kind of uh, upbringing is just uh, uh, something that uh, touched all of us. I have an identical twin brother who is now a member of AA, been a member for a couple of years. Uh, uh, I don't know that the violence did that to him, but it touched my, nor do I lay my alcoholism at the feet of my parents, but... Uh, my little sister was the victim of a lot of that. And she has worked out, she's not alcoholic, but she worked out her deal with uh, life and came to terms with life as the director of a home for battered women in Denver, Colorado. And my little brother is uh, the victim of domestic violence and uh, lives an almost totally risk-free life. In, in a little town in Georgia. He just takes no chances. He just paints stripes on a warehouse floor in Georgia and, uh, and wants nothing. And he's not unhappy, he, but he's so stifled. And he, and he showed such uh, promise as a little boy, articulate and fun-loving and bright, and it's gone, and it'll be gone. And that's his life. And so it touched me, and it made me feel guilty, and I knew I was a part of that and caused my share of it, and you just know that about yourself. And it has no rational basis, but there it is. My mother was a kind of a person that got a great comfort out of church and dragged us to church five and six times a week, and we were told to give our hearts to Jesus and we looked around, of course, my brother and I, at those people that had given their hearts to Jesus and they didn't look like they were any too happy about what they'd done with their heart, you know. <clears throat> it seemed to make them a little nervous and ill at ease. And I, I sat on the back pew of that church many, many Sunday mornings while the minister would get everybody worked up into kind of a white heat and there'd be an altar call and people would drift down to the front to get saved. And it was a bit, and you want to go. You know, it just feels so compelling to go down there and, and uh, if I could have just believed what they believed and could have bought into that thing, and, but it, it just never was possible for me to do that. 
But the guilt was certain. My uncle went down there one Sunday morning to get saved, and uh, they sent him to China after that to be a missionary. You know. <laughs> I'll keep you out of the front of the church. <laughs> and there's so many mixed messages, you know. The the uh, I had I grew up with the odd feeling that I had to deserve God's love. I had to if God if I'm good, God will. And my mother, if I'm good, my mother will love me. I don't I don't think she ever intended to give me that message, but that's somehow the message I got. And I, got, I must like guilt because I picked up a lot of guilt in those early years. And those mixed messages are kind of confusing. God loves you, and you're going to burn forever. Uh, mixed message about sex. Somebody articulated it not long ago. I kind of liked it. She said the mixed message on sex is sex is dirty and filthy and disgusting. And you should save it for the one you really love. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. That helps. And we grow up with a weird sense of potential, you know. I should be operating up here at this level, and I operate down here, and I guess life's work is to clean up my act and get it up here where it really ought to be, and I don't know quite how to do that. And I go to church, and I go to daily vacation Bible school, and I memorize all the Bible verses, and I know the books of the Bible, and I study, and, I, and about Tuesday I have a dirty thought, not a hell with it, you know. <laughs> Why well, try? And it's just... Uh, life became very frustrating for me early on, and uh, there it was. Reality was not my constant companion, you can be sure of that. I didn't have any sense of reality. I was ashamed of our home. I was ashamed of my mother. I, that, that bothered me very much. I was embarrassed by my mother and ashamed of that feeling. I knew I should be proud of her. And somehow I was not. My father embarrassed me. The car he drove embarrassed me. That nasty little house we lived in embarrassed me. The dog embarrassed me for Christ's sake. You know. <clears throat> he was always doing something awkward. It really didn't touch my... Uh, my brother so much. He grew up in the same home and an identical twin brother would have... But he he was more realistic. Now, I remember in the eighth grade, we moved a lot. We moved that year. We moved into Denver. And we got bus clear across town into an area because we got there in the middle of the year. We went to school in an area where the kids had some money. And sometimes after football practice, we'd get a ride home with somebody in their Cadillac or their Chrysler and their parents drive us uh, down there, and uh, I never wanted them to see where we lived. Never, because of that ugly house and that little nasty place. And I would, uh, if I were alone in the car, my brother wasn't there, I'd say, well, just let me out right here. And they'd let me out up on the hill a little bit in an area where the houses were painted and had grass in the front. And... Uh, I didn't want them to. I would gladly run six blocks to make sure they didn't see. And if my brother was in the car, he'd say, no, no, it's down here a little ways. <laughs> and wait until I got right in front of our house. And he'd say, that's it, right there. And I'd go, Jesus. <laughs> Did you have to tell him that? <laughs> After I got sober, I asked him about those days. He remembered, seemed to matter little to him, and he remembered those days. And I asked him, I said, didn't it bother you to have the people see that rat hole we lived in? And he said, you know, I never accepted the responsibility for the condition that place was in.
You see how sick he is? He... <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> and so there it was. I um, had my first drink when I was 17. And I remember it with a good deal of clarity. It was vodka and orange juice. It was after a football game in a little Quonset hut in North Africa where my mother died when we were 14 and my dad had to take us everywhere he went. And there we were going to high school in North Africa and it was after a football game in a Quonset hut in an Air Force base and vodka and orange juice. And I loved it. I understood for the first time that night why my dad drank. I thought he drank because he, so he could be meaner than he could otherwise be. And now I knew, and I had a secret, and I remember that with a great clarity, that second and third drink, and knowing where the supply was, I, which may be a clue that cl the, the remembrance of that event might signal. So I don't remember my first taco, as an example. You know. <laughs> And I was 17 years old, which is kind of a late start uh, by today's standards, but that's where it was I, the, for the next 11 years, 12 years. I drank all I could drink. And when I was uh, 29 years old, I was living in a garage in Glendale, California with three other guys, and things weren't going so good. And I had, along the way, been given a chance to go to college, and I did go to college. I'd been given a chance to go to dental school, and I did go. I started a four-year dental school program at the University of Oregon. Two years into that, they decided I was really ought to seek another career. Uh, we had a clinic on Saturday morning, and it made him a little uh, nervous to see me dancing around there. We were supposed to be doing something to a patient, you know, like cleaning teeth or plugging an amalgam, or, and I'd be dropping instruments all over the floor. And just see, I get drunk on Friday night, and um, I got drunk every night. But Friday night was mine, you know. I was willing to feel guilty about the rest of the nights, but Friday is sort of my night to get drunk. And Saturday, I wake up and I drop a couple of Dexamil and uh, I go in that clinic and try to be effective. And I, when I drink like that and take those uppers, my hands don't work real well. <laughs> and I rattled around inside people's mouths and made them very nervous. <laughs> they don't like to hear you say whoops when you're in their store. <laughs> So they threw me out, and uh, I did some pick and shovel work for a, a while, and then uh, I, there, I, there was a, a sign outside of the post office that year that said, the Marine Corps builds men. And that really had an effect on me. There, it, my dad was one of these guys that you used to ask a couple of questions. He only had a couple. One of which was, when are you going to be a man? You know, I don't know. I never said that to him, but how do you answer a question like, when are you going to be a man? What time is it now? I don't know. <laughs> how the hell do I know? My mother had some of her own. She'd say, um, have you found God yet? No, I haven't found God yet. I don't want to find God. I understand he's a little annoyed with me, and I just do not... Uh... <laughs> well, 
Oh, I know he holds me in the hollow of his hand. But uh, if he ever notices me there, he's going to give me one of those. You know. I don't want to find God. She liked to ask this one. Maybe these questions don't have any answers, but you think you should come up. Where are you going to spend eternity? Yeah. Or she'd take a few minutes and tell us where we were going to spend eternity. That's a colorful description. What will you do when you meet your maker? Hmm? I don't know. I don't know. So when I saw that sign outside the post office in Portland that said the Marine Corps builds men, I thought, I hope so. Oh, God. <laughs> Then the next time my dad asks that question, I'll, you know, I fought those battles long after anybody else was fighting them. I, I just uh, carried all of that with me. All of it. Every little... I think that everybody that I know well that comes into Alcoholics Anonymous, comes in carrying a bag of stuff we've lugged around for years. It's quite heavy. If you're new here and you're tired, I identify with that. I was whipped when I got here. I just was thrashed. And part of it is just lugging around that bag of crap we carry with us. Much of it, little tiny stuff. We were t I was talking with somebody yesterday about those nickel and dime compromises that, uh, and Hannah mentioned it this afternoon. Those nickel and dime compromises were a, a part of the fabric of my life, just woven right into it. There wasn't any way to get away from them. There wasn't, and those nickel and dime compromises, the ones that created the need to do so much drinking are the silliest little things. And we never seem to get away from them and we all know that we should rise above those things. And that somehow or other, we don't really, even after I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew that those were not the kinds of things that you would write down if you were taking a fourth step as an example. Surely it would not be necessary for me to talk about them to a sponsor. And they're little things, little goofy things that are just nuts. I, I found out the hard way while I was in the Marine Corps. I went in and I went through officer candidate school and I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps and I loved it. I really liked it. I was not so cool that I didn't want to be a good Marine. And I tried very hard. I only got one problem, and that is I'm a drunk, and it really got in the way. And I really, uh, the, the discovery that was remarkably slow in my mind, that I can't pack the gear, was a very painful discovery. And to stand, uh, stand in front, I was... Uh, uh, touch that uh, Lieutenant General Schneider was here last night. I stood in front of a two-star general at the Marine Corps Air Station at El Toro and got a letter of reprimand in 1965. He read uh, fitness reports that had been written about me, all of which were unsatisfactory. And when they turn in an unsat report, anybody that's been in the military knows that they that have gotten those, they, they just fill in a lot of detail. You know, they really buttress that unsat result with a lot of detail. And I stood at attention in front of a two-star general one sunny morning in El Toro, California and listened while he read a lot of derogatory detail about me. 
None of it big, all of it in the nickel and dime category, but all of it in conduct unbecoming an officer type stuff. And it was just a, makes a long morning of it, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> One major in reporting on me got, was very brief. I was grateful for his brevity, although the tone of the sentence he wrote was a little cold, I thought. He said, this lieutenant, talking about me, this lieutenant consistently fails to live up to the low standards he has set for himself. <laughs> The general said there isn't any room in the Marine Corps for an alcoholic lieutenant. I couldn't believe he said that about me. I mean, they didn't have any kind of a dry dock program or any AA on base in those days. There wasn't really anything he could do with me except to tell me, as was later told me, that I ought to resign my commission for the good of the service and to avoid trial by court-martial. But that morning he said there isn't any room in the Marine Corps for an alcoholic. And I knew he was nuts. I stood there at attention. My brass was polished. My shoes were shined. My hair was cut. My uniform was clean. And how on earth he could think I was an alcoholic was beyond me. I, that's a remarkable lapse of judgment for a general officer in the Marines, you know. It frightens you when you think about national securities entrusted to people like that. Mm -hmm. And he finally dismissed me, and I did an about-face and walked out of his office, and I knew he was nuts. I knew I was not an alcoholic. An alcoholic is some guy under a bridge with a couple of top coats all year round, a guy that's older than, some guy that's older than a tree by about three days. You know. I'm too young, and I'm too this, and I'm too that. And I knew I need I knew one more thing that morning. I I knew I needed a drink. Real bad. And I got a bottle of vodka and put it underneath the seat of my car and drove into those orange groves north of that base. And I did that more than once and I always did it for two drinks. That's all I wanted. I didn't want to get drunk. I would have bought bourbon, you know. But I bought vodka. You know why. I almost started to explain that to this group. <laughs> Forgive me, I thought this was Parents Without Partners there for a minute. <laughs> But it's a sad time. It's a, after I got in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I got to AA and I, I heard something one night at a meeting that I, I've never forgotten. A gal that died last year sober, a gal named Gail, was uh, one of those uh, attractive people to me when I came in. She was about a year ahead of me and she'd been an airline stewardess and she looked stylish and she looked uh, um, bright. And she, there was something else about her that attracted me very much to her as a member of AA. She looked like she wasn't anybody's dummy. It, it, she, it comforted me that she believed in AA because I didn't think she'd believe in anything that wasn't really put to the test. You know how you see some people and you know damn well that if they're buying into this thing it has some merit just because they're not the kind of... They just, you just know they're skeptical. You just know that they're the kind of people that, that have pushed it to the wall. And here she was in these meetings, staying sober, a little nutty, a little scared. I saw her sit on Polly Hall's lap one afternoon and just get hugged because she was afraid. But she was hanging in there. And, she, and I, w I will long remember that evening at uh, Wilshire, Normandy in Los Angeles, hearing Gail talk. And she touched me because she spoke of the alcoholic's prayer. 
And I'd said that prayer so many times and never thought of it as a prayer. She, she described it, she'd come out of a blackout in an apartment in Hollywood, sitting on the mantel in the living room with her cat. And uh, up there with Gail and her cat was uh, some vodka and some cat food. Uh, a little something for everybody, you know. <laughs> and the reason she was up there was because there was about eight inches of water on the floor. And that was because she had started to take a bath last Tuesday and the whole deal had gotten away from her somehow. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, I like Gail. Gail is... Uh, she's up there watching furniture float by. You know. <clears throat> she's my kind of girl, I guess. And she said she sat up there on the mantel and said the alcoholic's prayer, and I'm spellbound. And she went on to say that the alcoholic's prayer goes like this. Jesus, God, what's wrong with me? And I have said that prayer, haven't we? I said it in the orange groves. I said it in the drunk tank. I said it in the garage. I said it every place. And it seemed to be as much a part of my life following the nickel and dime transgressions as the big stuff. I was, uh, in those days, out on the prowl. I was married. I had a little boy. But I was out there in the bars. And part of that quest was looking for her. I looked in the bars. I didn't look anyplace else. I didn't hang around the library waiting for her to show up. I knew I'd find her in a bar, and I found her one night in a party. I was an air observer in the Marines, uh, but... Went, which is, I flew around the left seat of a helicopter or the back seat of an F-4 and um, observed the air, is what I did. <laughs> Not demanding stuff, but there it is. But I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And so when I got on Liberty, I became a fighter pilot. cold-blooded, steely-eyed, sex-crazed, professional killer. <laughs> if you can hold your hands like that, you can be a fighter pilot on liberty. And I'm at a party one night, and my wife and little boy are at home, and I am at this party, and I meet her. And it just gets your soul going, you know. God, there was that thing between us. And it just was beautiful. brings tears to your eyes. Oh, God, we were doing well, and I'm telling fighter pilot stories, and she's just, she was a school teacher, and it was on Balboa Island. Everybody was either a lieutenant in the Marines or a school teacher, and you could tell the difference by the length of their hair. And um, out of nowhere, this lady that... I had just decided to spend the rest of my life with uh, ask a really awkward question. She said, how come you're drinking so much? And I, you know, I don't have any answer for that. None at all. And I... What I said to her, the lie that I responded with is a lie that I've never forgotten. It's these nickel and dime compromises never show up on police blotters. They are neither misdemeanors nor felonies. They're not even infractions. They're not the kind of thing that society locks us up for. It's just that somehow or other they never go away. And that night, looking at that little girl, in response to a question for which I have no answer, when she said, how come you're drinking so much, I said, unrehearsed, my wife and little boy were recently killed in a car wreck. And uh, if you're new here tonight and you have a little trash like that with you, welcome. <laughs> that will lose its power, but not until you write it down and then read it to somebody. 
This program is for guys like us, for men and women like us that can't deal with the nickels and dimes. We're not so bad in crisis sometimes. We don't do so bad with uh, some of the basic things. But the nickels, you know, I couldn't, the, I could not think of that lie. And surely to God a man would not deny the existence of his own family just to impress some girl at a party. And my life had become full of those kinds of things. And when you think of them, you need a drink. I couldn't wake up in the morning with that thought on my mind and not reach for a drink. I didn't always have it on my mind, but when it was there, it had a capacity to make me know that I was never that my father was right, that I would never be a man. And you need a drink real bad. And you drive miles out of your way to get one. You may not even let it reach your conscious mind, but there you are writing a bad check. There you are going, sneaking out of the house. There you are doing this and that. Nickels and dimes of my life. Those little turns we make as we go along. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, when that bail bondsman brought me to you, I had no idea that I would have to deal with all those things. I had the idea that it was the big things that had caused all the trouble. And I was pleased to hear you talk about felonies and jail time, and I could talk about being in a drunk tank. That comes to us fairly quickly after we've been here a few weeks because everybody makes it easy to talk like that because we look back in relief and gratitude and smile about those things. But there's something about getting right down inside of me where I really live and talking about the nickels and dimes that is a little more difficult. And there are a lot of them, and there they lay. And that's not so good. But you know, I loved it in AA. That guy brought me to that meeting that in July of 1966. I got drunk once more after that, and the last time I had a drink was on the 14th day of August, 1966, and so I've been here with you for a little over 18 years now, and I am just uh, astonished that this program works as well as it does for a guy like me. It seems to be precisely de designed to help me live, to make it possible for me to live in this world. And I had no idea that it would do that. I had no idea on the 14th day of August 1966 that I had had my last drink. I just And if you're here tonight and you're not sure, in fact, if you really have a gut knowledge that you won't make it here, welcome. Welcome. If you're sure within four weeks or six that you'll be gone because we will have found out who you really are or because you just can't make it with the likes of these marvelous looking people, welcome. Welcome. I wasn't doing so hot when I got here and I knew I wasn't going to make it. And it seems like a remarkable thing. I had no idea that that was going to be my last drink and I'm glad I didn't know that it was my last drink. I think if I'd have known, I would have had two, you know. Uh, probably. <clears throat> and the guy that runs the coffee bar in Oxnard would be your speaker tonight. <laughs> Another thing has uh, been of interest to me. I was told that we get what we deserve. And along the way, I thought that was the case. I believed that. And I looked for justice. <laughs> Those were the days I was asking for badge numbers and jury trials. 
God, if you're new, don't ask for justice. <laughs> Most of us have had about all the justice we can stand. My sponsor has taught me to ask for mercy, not justice. <laughs> and incidentally, I've gotten it. You've dealt with me at the level of my need and never at the level of my merit, and I'm grateful for that. But I thought I would get what I deserve, and it makes you very uneasy when you're guilty like I am. And yet, you know, the remarkable thing about it is that I'm not sober today because I deserve to be sober. I don't know, I don't even get into that. People come up and say, oh, of course you deserve to be sober. Well, that may be the case. I don't know about that. All I know is that on the 14th day of August, 1966, I was a drunk. On the 15th day of August, 1966, I was not a drunk, and I haven't been a drunk since. Now, I don't believe that I deserved any more or any less on the 15th than I did on the 14th. I just did not deserve... I don't believe that what I deserve has anything to do with anything. It's a trap that I fell into many, many times, but it isn't that... You know, the remarkable thing that happened to me at that meeting... That remarkable thing that happened to me in that little club in Glendale in 1966 was that I discovered for the first time in my life that I wasn't the only one. I discovered for the first time in my life that there were other people that drank the way I drank. And I knew, I don't know how I knew, but I believed you when you said you weren't drinking. And something else happened. You said you don't ever have to take another drink again as long as you live if you don't want to. You gave me a choice, and I had no choice up till that day. And that night I had a choice, and I have one today, and so do you. And I believe with everything in me tonight that we don't get what we deserve, we get what we choose. And today I chose not to drink. And I'm most grateful that you gave me that choice. And that's the way that's been. That whole business about potential is so goofy. You know, that thing about I should... That's a strange idea that I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous with me. That somehow or other I have potential, which means that I should be moving up here somehow. And the truth of the... When you think about it in terms of alcoholism, it's kind of easy to see. I really believed I was a social drinker. Oh, I get a little drunk now and then, but I'm going to stop going to that beer bar. I'm going to remember to eat. I'm going to stop taking those pills that seem to cause all the trouble. But I'm really a social drinker. Well, that gap closes, you know, but never the way I thought it would. You know how it closes? The day I say... I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. And then the only question is, what do I want to do about that? And today you can hardly tell me from a real person, you know. <laughs> I'm basically honest. Oh, I tell a white lie now. Well, I'm a liar is what I am. <laughs> mm. Mm. Which gets me to uh, an interesting thing that I've been uh, thinking about a lot lately. And that is the business of acceptance, because that's all that is, is acceptance. I was brought up to know that that little boy in there ought not be heard and rarely seen that he had no merit and deserved no consideration. I mean, that's just the nature of the home in which I was raised. And I have treated that little boy about the same way as I learned to treat him. I was taught by example to treat him a certain way. That's the way my father taught, treated him and my grandmother and my mother. And that's the way I've treated him. Instead of allowing that little boy to be a little boy and to allow my adult to be an adult, I just want to give that little boy all kinds of hell for every goofy thought he has, for every stray notion he has, for every silly mistake he makes. I'm just going to grind it. But the trouble is, 
I can't treat anybody else any better than I'm treating that little boy, which gets in the way of having any fun with other human beings, you know. But that business of acceptance seems to be an important part of our recovery, the capacity to accept. Our, they say on the golf circuit you have play it where it lays, and I, I have a lot of trouble with that. I want to... I want to have it on the green all the time and look cool. I don't want to admit it's in the sand trap. And the only problem with that is when I'm on the green and the ball's in the sand trap, I can look cool for a long time, but the ball never moves. <laughs> Until I say, oh, oh, it's in the sand trap. Oh, the ball is in the sand trap. Oh, the ball is in the sand trap. Oh. And then when you walk over there, it doesn't really take much to get it moving. Not really. The key is that you have to get over there where it is, play it where it lays. I struggled with this program because I didn't really believe that those 12 steps meant what they said. I didn't really believe that you would want me to apply those in my life. And surely to God, not all of them, 12 steps, six have to be put in there just for drill. You know, it just... Somebody told me one night something very interesting. They said the first hundred drunks, the ones that wrote that book, Bill and all those guys, didn't want to work 12 steps either. But they wanted to stay sober, and if they'd have found a way to stay sober on seven steps, that's all the steps we'd have. And I thought, by God, that's right. Why would they want to work 12 steps? All they wanted to do was stay sober. And that's all I want to do. And I had, but you know, you really think I'm going to turn my will and my life over to the care of God? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> He's going to send my butt to China if I do that. <laughs> I had some extraordinary events happen to me. Uh, my sponsor used to tell a story about a, a guy that lived in a fishing village in Alaska. And this guy was a lot like me. What he did to stay alive, he didn't work, he didn't do any of that, but he would at the end of the day go up to a different fishing vessel and say to the skipper, give me a piece of fish. And they'd throw him a piece of fish and he'd scuttle off someplace and cook it up and eat it and sleep under a bridge and the next day the boats would be back in after their day's catch and he'd go up to another boat and ask the skipper to give me a piece of fish and that's how he made it. And it seemed to go okay until one day he had the bad luck and that was he went up to a new boat in the fleet a skipper that he hadn't approached before and said, give me a piece of fish. And the skipper said, I can't. He said, sure you can. You got tuna to the gunnels there. You can give me a piece of fish. You'll never miss it. He said, well, you know, I really can't. I can't do that. I, I, I tell you what I could do. I could bring you aboard for a season and teach you how to fish so you never have to ask anybody for fish again. But it's not in me just to throw you a piece of fish. To do that is to do nothing for you and I'd really rather not do that you want to come aboard and the guy was just like me he said no no I don't want to be a nuisance I don't want to bother you I don't want to take up your time thanks Mac just give me a piece of fish and I'll be on my way God I identified with that guy I was around this program give me a piece of fish don't make me write an inventory don't tell me I have to go to a meeting every night give me a piece of fish I'm not going to make a decision to turn my will in my life give me a piece of fish list my phone number in my right name not me uh uh give me a piece of fish and I had uh, what seemed like bad luck at the time I ran into a group of people that uh, wouldn't give me any fish they really would not they just, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. I, 
This program is not negotiable. When I was here two and a half years ago, a gal spoke. I was touched by what she said because she talked about uh, the carpenter and how somebody came up to him one day and said, how do I uh, get into the kingdom of heaven? And he said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And the guy said, oh, I can't do that, and he walked away. The interesting thing was the carpenter didn't go after him and say there's a half-price sale on the kingdom of heaven today. He just let him go. You know, it's not negotiable. It isn't negotiable. The half measures get us absolutely nowhere. I went to my sponsor one day and said, I, I'm so angry at my ex-wife, I can't stand it. And we talked about it at some length, and he finally got around to a question that I really didn't want to talk about. He said, how's that child support payments doing? And I told him that when she shaped up, I was going to start that again. <laughs> and he said, if you want to change how you feel about somebody, and that's really what we're talking about, is And I said, yeah, I hate her. He said, if you want to change how you feel something about somebody, you have to change how you treat them. And in your case, that means sending the child support payment. That's your responsibility to send. I didn't want to do that. He said, in fact, what he said was, if you can't send it, you get yourself another sponsor. Um, we're not in the fish business over there. You know. <laughs> and I began to do that. I didn't want to do it, but I began to do it. I didn't have a checking account until I was five years sober, so I just added another money order to my list, and she got a money order every payday. And I began to feel better about me and about her immediately. didn't matter that I didn't want to do it. It just, I began to feel better about her. My son is 20 now, and he's... Uh, a junior at Oregon State. And he's a remarkable young man. He's just one of those people that fits in the world. No thanks to me. His mother's done a remarkable job with him. And I could have missed that if I'd have been... Because when I don't send the child support, I can't have that relationship. I just stop all that. I just have to deny myself that out of guilt or whatever. And he comes down to visit Pat and me, and we have a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Him and me. He goes to meetings with me, and we laugh, and we cry together, and we talk about God, and we talk about God's grace, and we talk about any number of things, his girlfriends, and he's... He's having the time of his life. He's a rush chairman at a fraternity up there at Oregon State. Oh, God. He just has the biggest time in the world. And he and I are good friends today. And he fits out there. And uh, I'm so grateful that you wouldn't give me any fish long ago. First time I ever trusted anybody was an Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was kind of a funny thing. I was nine months sober. I was, they let me on Monday night in Glendale at the club. They let me set up the chairs and make the coffee. And I liked doing that. I had the straightest rows of chairs in that meeting of any meeting in town. <laughs> and I liked doing it because I discovered something important. I felt like I had a right to take up a chair in one of those meetings if I had done something. Which is another thing if you're new here. Don't be afraid to get in there and earn yourself a seat by setting out ashtrays or picking cups up after the meeting or helping clean the place up or setting it up. That's an important part of the thing. If you don't do it, somebody else will do it. But if you don't do it, you won't feel as comfortable about that meeting as you should feel, as you have the right to feel. And so I loved doing that. And I'd get there early on Monday and I would set those chairs up and I'd get the coffee going. And one night about 7 o'clock, I'm just kind of hanging out waiting for people to come to the meeting. And a group of people came in that were on the H&I panel, about five of them. They came in and they'd been sober seven or eight years. 
And they were just fun-loving people and extraordinarily attractive to me. The same love as our attraction. They loved one another as you love one another. And there's nothing more attractive on this earth than the sense of looking at people that love one another. And they loved one another. And wonder of wonders, that night they asked me if I would go with them. I was delighted. And pretty soon we're all traipsing down the stairs from that club in Glendale into the parking lot and we got in Bill Christian's old Chrysler and I sat in the middle in the back seat and listened to these people with seven, eight, ten, twelve years of sobriety laugh and talk and we go down the freeway and we're going to a meeting in a mental hospital and they're going to put on a meeting down there as part of the H&I committee and they had invited me to go along and I was just thrilled. And we pulled off the freeway after about 25 minutes and we pulled into a big parking lot and they told me the meeting was in that brick building about 100 yards away and we got out of the car and then it hit me. I just damned my knees almost buckled. I just thought, I'm getting slow. How did I not get it? It just, six of us are going in that mental hospital. Five of them are coming back out. I just, son of them. And my second thought was, I can outrun every one of these old fools. And then I had a remarkable thought. I thought, if they think I need to be in that nut house, maybe I do. I didn't exactly make it a cakewalk going over there, but I kept up with them, and I went in the building with them, and we went in the day room, and an orderly came in and brought the patients in, and I sat there, and they asked me to read chapter 5 that night, as I recall, and I didn't do anything but read chapter 5. I watched those patients and wondered how I'd look in paper slippers, and <laughs> in an hour that meeting was over, and we stood up and held hands and said the Lord's Prayer. And the orderly came in and took the patients back out of the day room and up to their ward. And then the six of us walked back outside and across that pavement and into Bill Christian's old Chrysler. I sat in the middle in the back seat. And we drove to Glendale and they were chattering and laughing and I was so glad to be with them. And I slept in my own bed that night. Grateful. Grateful for you and grateful for a place to sleep. I was out of the garage by now and into a little tiny apartment. I sold imprinted ballpoint pens and then I got a job selling dictating equipment and then I sold a little computer for a bit and then I was selling carpets and I was about uh, four years sober and I heard a guy named Chuck C. talking one night and I didn't like selling carpets real well. My heart was not in it. And he said something I've never forgotten. He said, if you're working five days a week just to get the two free ones at the end, you're, that's self-robbery is what he said. And I knew people that loved their jobs and enjoyed what they did for a living and seemed to get a great joy out of that. I knew people on this program that lived seven days a week. I sponsored a couple of them by now, and I, I was so envious of that capacity to really have your heart in what you did for a living. And by this time, I had made that decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. And somewhere along the line, it became obvious even to me that maybe God did know something about business after all. And the search was on. And it. one day, I was helping somebody move. Another guy and I were in the back of a stake bed truck helping yet another alcoholic move into yet another upstairs apartment in the back. <laughs> and this guy turned to me and he said, Clint, you ought to go to law school. And I, my mind immediately slammed shut the way it does. 
and I remembered I'd promised to keep an open mind about all these silly... I, if the search was on, I really had to look at any goofy thing that came along, and I began to look into it. I found out I'd have to get my transcripts gathered together. I found I could do it, but it'd take... I'd have to go at night, because i got to work during the day. God knows I want to pay that child support. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it's a funny thing about... When I finally did become willing to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, he didn't want me in China. He just wanted me to stay in Santa Monica and pay child support is what he had in mind. <laughs> I found out I could go to law school, but I'd have to go at night, and it'd take four years. And I went back to this guy... You know how old I'll be in four years if I go to law school. And that remarkable response that I've never forgotten. He said, how old will you be in four years if you don't go to law school? <laughs> and so in 1971, I started that rather brisk journey, and I was working during the day and going to meetings at night and going to law school three nights a week and studying like hell on weekends and trying to keep it all in priority and the priority is very, very simple. AA is first, period. And it works out somehow and the four years do go by. There were a lot of AAs there that day I graduated. Then I had to get ready for the California State Bar Examination, which is a challenge. <laughs> Something less than half the people that take it pass it the first time, and not very many do after that. And it's a tough three-day examination that's given in the middle of the summer in Los Angeles and again in the early part of the spring in February. And I got ready for, I was supposed to get ready for the summer exam, the one that's in August, because I just graduated in May or end of May. And that's a tough deal. And I took a couple of months off work, but you know, the toughest part of it of all, I think, for me, was not so much the studying for it or even the taking of it, they have an application that you have to fill out to take that examination, and that application asks a lot of information. They wanted to know, for example, what my residence address had been since I was 16 years old. I had a study buddy. Ron and I were very close in law school, and I loved him very much, and he was just a remarkable kind of a straight arrow guy, uh, just Johnny at the rat hole, and he had... He answered that question by writing down three addresses. I had several columns of addresses, you know, two weeks here, a month there, a, a Pontiac I listed as a... You know, where is this? Were you... Uh, ever convicted of anything other than a minor traffic violation. And they leave three little lines for that one. Uh, and I typed in see attached page on the middle line. <clears throat> I did not want to put it all down there. I knew what my rap sheet looked like and there was some stuff they would not find out and I went to my sponsor and I said you know I really want to I, I just why take a chance I worked hard for four, week, four years and I don't want to put all that down my, my friends uh, Chuck and Susie or I remember Susie and I talked about it we both worked at the same place put all that down there on that application that's crazy they won't find out. And yet, my sponsor was very helpful. This is an extremely practical program. And he pointed out something to me that I've never forgotten. He said, 
you could get by with it probably and just put down part of it. You know what they won't pick up on the uh, investigation. But if you put it down there and leave out some of it, you're going to know in the back of your mind, no matter how hard you try to get away from it, that they're going to catch you. And that's going to make it impossible for you to really get ready for the test. Because you'll figure what the hell are going to catch me anyway. But if you put it all down there and they still let you take the test, nothing will hold you back. And I knew he was right. And I put it all down there and sent it, bundled it all up with twine and sent it up to him. <laughs> And they let me take their test, and I had to wait then for four months to find out if I'd passed. And on Thanksgiving Eve in 1975, I got a call from a guy I sponsored who worked at one of the local newspapers, and he said, we have the list, and your name is on the list. And I said, what list is that Do you have there, slip? <laughs> But there it was. Chuck and Susie came by that night. We laughed and carried on, and uh, I had passed that goofy test. The next day was Thanksgiving. I, I sat at the breakfast table and cried that Thanksgiving day. That just seemed to, to me such a long way. I was nine years sober. I'd put in four years doing that, and I wept on Thanksgiving day. By that afternoon, I was thinking... You know, they really ought to tighten it up to keep the dummies out of this deal. <laughs> but I love it. I've been back over to that courthouse in Glendale a few times. It's different. Answering ready for the defendant in the superior court is different than standing there in the municipal court as the defendant. It's different. It's only one flight up, but it's light years away. You see, I'm just a drunk, and I can't make it. And I'm not drinking today, and that's God's grace. That is God's grace. This is the greatest lost and found apartment in the world. It's just remarkable. If my mother were here tonight, she'd still be asking, what are you going to do when you meet your maker? I used to think I'd tell her, I got to AA and I paid all the money back. But you know, the answer is a little different than that. There's a more precise answer. If she were here tonight and would say, what will you do when you meet your maker? The real answer is we've already met. We, I meet him every day. I meet him here with you and I meet him in the car in the morning when I get on the freeway and head up to work with a certain knowledge that I cannot do the things that day will demand of me to do. And I say, please come into my life. Please come into my day. I cannot make it through this day, and I do not have to make it through this day, because I have you to... And I know he loves me. If he didn't love me, I'd still be in that Glendale drunk tank. There's no question that he loves me. It isn't, and never did have anything to do with what I deserve or with my potential. It never did have anything to do with any of those goofy ideas that I came dragging in here with. I, God loves me and he loves you. Another thing that gal said that day, she said that the, uh, a couple of years ago she was talking, it was at Easter time, it was Palm Sunday, and she said the greatest event in all Christendom 2,000 years ago was that resurrection. That's the miracle that most of the Western world celebrates as the greatest miracle of all, and yet, the miracle has happened to us. We are resurrected. And that's no less a miracle because it happened to me or you. It's a miracle. And we are miracles. I was reading this book called Alcoholics Anonymous and they slipped in another sentence that I hadn't noticed earlier. On page 28 of this book called Alcoholics Anonymous, it, there is a remarkable sentence. 
and I'm going to close with it. It says this, If what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living Creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. And I have become, by God's grace, willing and honest enough to try. And that relationship is forming and it's adding substance to my life and it's allowing me to live in the world and be part of this remarkable weekend with you. And if you're new and starting your experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe you're not even a real alcoholic. You might just be a mild case. <laughs> but you're welcome here. You don't have to even have a burning desire to stop drinking. I'll tell you what, if you're willing to become willing to look into the possibility of becoming willing to become willing, to become willing to postpone one drink one day, you're at as good a starting place as you need to be, and you'll get a lot of love here. Thank you.